I'm Brian Howell with Pro Video Coalition, and I'm here with Cook. We're talking lenses. I am in my garage, and they are working from home as well. We're all trying to stay safe in the coronavirus world. Usually at NAB, we would be squashed in together, talking lenses, looking at lenses, but we can't. But we can take deep dives. We can talk about much more than we can usually talk about in the 15 minutes we might have with less. Les, will you uh, introduce yourself for those who don't know who you are? Shame on you if you don't. Sure. <laughs> uh, my name is Les Zellin. I'm chairman of Cook Optics. I have been uh, took over the company in 98, so I've been doing this for about 22, 23, 22, going on 23 years. Uh, in that time, uh, Cook has gone from barely alive to uh, back to an back to an industry leader, where which which it has been for most of its hundred and 30 year history. So um, I'm pleased to say that it is in really great shape now. And uh, we continue to innovate and produce uh, new lenses and lens series and new tools for the industry. I think in fact, somebody's gonna put, call me out on this. So I just think this is the truth. I think we make more lens series for the industry than anyone else. So um, I'm quite pleased uh, with where we've come in the last 22 years. And of course, there's more to come over the next, hopefully, well, we've been around for 130 years. So hopefully the next 130 years will be just as exciting. What what would Cook be highlighting or want people to look at if they were in their booth on the NAB convention floor? Well, we were planning to show uh, one lens that we had shown in, uh, that actually premiered at the PSC show earlier this year, which was the 85 millimeter macro for full frame anamorphic, part of our full frame anamorphic series, or more correctly, anamorphic full frame series. Um, and that is for people that are familiar with our super 35 anamorphics, that is a roughly the same angle of view as the 65 that we make for standard 35 um, or super 35 anamorphic. And so, and, which, and that's a macro as well. And that's a very popular lens. Uh, in addition, in the, in, the, in the anamorphic full frame series, we were also going to be showing a 180. Um, you can imagine that the and there'll, there'll be some more lenses coming out in this series. It'll be very similar, in fact, to our Super 35 series. So the idea is to be able to cover any production at any focal length they need. Um, and that's quite exciting. Uh, our 1.8 format, our 1.8 squeeze format for full frame anamorphic has been really well received. It's very exciting. It, uh, it allows you to shoot at uh, for a 2.4 release and look almost identical to a 2X squeeze without losing very much information. And it allows you to release a 2.7, which is just under pan, super panovision, ultra panovision, if you want to use the full chip. Um, the reason we did not do a 2X squeeze is that if you want to want to release in, in 2.4, you just lose too much information. You lose about 25% of the pixels. And um, so anyway, 1.8 seems to work really well. It's been very well received. Uh, we have a long waiting list. So that's all good news for anamorphic uh, full frame. So now that we have it, we have the Aerie LF, the Aerie LF Mini, Sony Venice, Sony FX9, the Canon C700, the C500 Mark II and you know, Red Vista Vision. What is it about um, like full frame, large format anamorphic that people are kind of chasing after that look? Because I'm imagining that depth of field is razor thin at 85 <laughs> wide open. <laughs> well, you know what? I think what they're chasing is what they've been chasing ever since people started shooting video and then high depth and then, you know, wherever we are now, whatever resolution we are at now, they're, ch they're chasing, you know, I, I, I wearing my personal hat, not my cook hat. Let me cover up my little badge here. Oops, there it is. I'll cover up my badge. Um, I'm wearing my personal hat. 
For the longest time, I really didn't see much use in the full frame. Um, I, I understand the camera guys wanted because they were thought they were going to run out of Super 35 to sell. And obviously for the Japanese, Super 35 is a technology they already own uh, in the still and digital world. So um, for, the, for the longest time, I thought, why are we chasing these bigger sizes and these bigger chips to produce sterile, boring images for people to watch them on their cell phones, you know? And so one of the things we noticed when digital came in is, of course, people, because they think digital is a full frame or HD for that matter, is a, is a sterile and boring format. What people started to do is chase after old, old lenses. Anything that would sort of knock the edge off the uh, digitalness of the image and what people have been doing from the beginning is trying to make digital look like film, give it character, give it personality. Uh, we didn't build, we've been asked since I took over Cook 22 years ago to build anamorphic lenses. But until digital came out, it didn't make any sense. The market for anamorphic was very small and Panavision more or less owned that market. Uh, digital took this very small clubby market that was basically the rental houses around the world and democratized shooting and made anamorphic so much easier to shoot in uh, digital than it is in film. So it took this little teeny market and virtually overnight <laughs> grew it to this. And as soon as that happened, uh, I went back to base and said, guys, let's do anamorphic. Because it solves the problems that I see in digital, which is that it's sterile and boring. And of course, as the engineers at Sony and Canon and all the other places push, you know, for 2K, 4K, 8K, a billion K, the um, ultimate resolution doesn't necessarily make a picture that anybody wants to watch for storytelling. So we came out with traditional anamorphics and that is anamorphics that look anamorphic. They have all the distortion. We didn't try to take it out. They have the, the look look all bulky. They have all the things that make uh, anamorphic interesting. We have two sets, two very, we have two variations of the lenses, one in regular, one in what we call super flare or special flare. And, um, you know, and, and the difference is how much streaking you want to be able to achieve. Uh, I, I personally think all streaking all the time gets to be a little, it loses its effect if it's all streaking all the time. And even on our special flare, you can control how much streaking you get. So, but we're trying to give what we've always tried to do, and that is give the industry the tools they need. And so we're, uh, you know, we're pretty excited. Going back to your question of why are people shooting, you know, a full frame, uh, I've talked to a bunch, obviously I talked to a lot of DPs and those that uh, really understand it, really see it as a whole new medium. They're now shooting at a new ratio, a three by two ratio instead of a four by three ratio. And it gives them um, maybe the opportunity just to tell stories a little bit differently than they have in the past. And now <laughs> I was talking to somebody the other day and he said, with social distancing and full frame and anamorphic full frame going to 2.7, <clears throat> we can have actors now, you know, six feet apart and still get a two shot. <laughs> so um, we'll, um, you know, I, it, it's quite an interesting time. And obviously full frame is sort of where it is, well, it's not sort of, it's where things are going. And, you know, even though that I know a lot of the Sony Venices are being used in Super 35 mode, I don't think Super 35 is dead and buried. I just think it's now full frame is just another tool. Um, and, you know, so wearing my cook hat, I love digital and I love all this because it's created such a bigger, bigger market for us and expanded not only my business, but all the lens makers business exponentially uh, in, a, in the period of years since Red introduced the Red One. You know, oftentimes people talk about the Cook look, the people I know, when they shoot on Cook, 
they always always have the social media posts. They always have the, the shot with them with the camera and the lens, and it's it's as if they've arrived. What is it about the cook look that just intoxicates camera people? Well, we're so happy that uh, that works, obviously. And the phrase "the cook look" was not invented by us; it was given to us by early cinematographers, and uh, they noticed it and they started using it. And then we quickly trademarked it, of course. Um, but um, there are cases. The cook look evolved in the out of the uh, early twenties when we introduced the speed pancros. Um, and it just, you know, I don't know if it was by accident. Well, I know it wasn't by accident. I know the way they did the, the philosophy that went into the lens, uh, which I won't tell you because that would tell you the secrets of the cook look, but because of the way they designed the cook lenses at the time, the cook look became a byproduct of it. And as we saw people liked it, we've kept that philosophy uh, in our design throughout our throughout throughout the last hundred years. So every every cook lens has the cook look and it it is simply a look that is natural. It's a look that makes people look good. It has a nice fall off of focus. It is not overly contrasting. Even you know people do you look at some of my competitors and you look at them on, let's say, a projector, and they, you go, ooh, look at look at how, you know, you look at the contrast, how white and black it is. And you think, wow, look at that, that must be resolution. But it's not resolution, it's contrast, which is different than resolution. In fact, the way we balance our, our contrast in our lenses, you'll probably find more resolution in a cook lens than some of our competitors that are more contrasting. Nothing comes for free in optics. Uh, there's always a cost. And that doesn't make one trade off right or wrong. It just means you're always balancing the trade offs, you know, in, 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 the, in the design. It turns out we've come up with what I think is really a great recipe um, that people have. And it's been one of the things is it's been consistent. If you look at some of my competitors' lens from 20 years ago, they, some of them are warm, some of them are cool, some of them are all over the place. In the last 20 years, since we introduced the S4s, which, which led, the Primos led the new lens resolution in the late 80s. And then the S4s led the non-Panavision revolution, which started in the late 90s. Uh, and so everybody has redesigned their lenses. And from that point on, we've all just developed where our personality and our philosophy never change, other companies have finally sort of zeroed in on what their, their look is and what their philosophy is. And that's a good thing for cinematographers. You know, if you think of it, you know, you think you've got a cook paintbrush, you've got a brand Z paintbrush, you've got you know, various looks that you can get from various lenses. Now, do I think cook is right for almost every movie? You bet. But um, and I'm not a shooter, so <laughs> um, I'll leave that for the. Uh, if we all look the same, it would be sort of a boring world. But the cook look. Uh, if you go on the cook website, we have quite a few people. We've asked quite a few people either to write it up or they'll send it to us, you know, unannounced on what they think the cook look is, and they all say basically the same thing in so many words, and that is, you know. It's just natural, it makes people look good. It's got a great fall off of focus. It's got great resolution. Um, uh, one, one of the ones that I like really, somebody said they are, they are um, what did it say? They, uh, I can't remember the exact quote, but it's something like, uh, they look great, they're never harsh. You know, they, they have all the resolution, but they're never harsh. And that's, that, that again is the balance between how we balance our color and our contrast. So we've just hit the right recipe. Um, again, as I said, and we hit it because of how they designed the original speed pancros. And I'm not sure they were looking for this or it was a byproduct of the design philosophy, but in either case, it's worked out. It's worked out really well for us um, over time. 
So now other than the anamorphic 85 millimeter macro, what other lenses does Cook, what well, Cook we were, have we shown off? So we are continuing to expand the S7 series, which is our spherical full frame series. And, and we were going to be showing a 300 millimeter S7. And then we were starting a whole new branch of the SM, S7 family by showing a 60 and then, and then later this year a 90 and a 150 one to one full frame macro lens. And the, the important thing about all of our lenses, but particularly uh, these macro lenses, as well as all the cook lenses, S4s, the fives, the minis, the anamorphics, um, the Pancro classics, the S7s, and the, S and, the, and the full frame anamorphics, is that they're all designed from the ground up. These aren't converted still lenses. These are lenses that are really made to stand the rigors of the motion picture industry. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, we're quite proud that we don't rehouse things as some nameless manufacturers do and then call them known, uh, call them uh, motion picture lenses. So, um, but th these macros are one-to-one. -one, so, I mean, they, again, they can be used in any format and they differ from the macros, the 85 we just talked about previously. And we have a, a 65 macro in the Pancro Classic Series, which is spherical. And we have a 65 macro in the Super 35 Anamorphic Series. These are, sort of macro light. They're one to four. They're not one to one. So these, this new series of the 60, the 90, and the 150 will go to one to one. And since they're full frame, basically you can use them in, in any format you want. One to one is, is an incredible macro. I'm imagining that wasn't hard to achieve in a, in a high quality cinema lens. It's like a 64. Uh, yeah, I mean, and most people that do it, uh, most other people that do it, they do it in a, uh, by taking, you know, existing still lenses and repackaging them. Uh, that's not something we would, it would never cross our minds. So these are lenses that we designed and yeah, it, it's, it's a nice piece of work. I think the industry will be pleased with it. And of course, it's got the cook look, so it'll cut with any of our lenses. Um, I, I think the industry will be pleased. How many lenses are in the Series 7 set now? We, when we started with the S4s, we had, in 98, we made four lenses. That has grown to 18 lenses in the S4 series. In the S7, nine lenses. Most of our series now are quite complete. You know, one of the things we we worked hard at is to listen to the industry and give them uh, the tools they want. And a great example of that is our 27 millimeter. When we originally made the S4s, it was 18, 18, 21, 32, 40. And then listening to the industry, we now have a 21, a 27, and a 35. And the reason, the first one of those was the 27. And the reason we did that is that this goes back obviously close to 20 years. Uh, Otto and Denny and uh, other houses in um, LA came to us and said, Panavision's got a 27. We need a 27. You know, we've got people coming in and said, oh, if you don't have a 27, we have to go to Panavision. And my first thought was, move the camera. But I understand moving the camera does not change the does not change the angle of the, the perspective angle. It just gets you closer or further away. So I said, okay, and you know, I never really said move the camera to them. I said, okay. And of course we went back and it was not a big stretch to, to you know, look at the 25 and convert it to a 27 and you know, change the glass and change the angle of view and make it a, and come up with a 27. And to my great surprise, 27 became one of our best-selling lenses without hurting the sales of the, third, the 25. So, I mean, I, I always said that we would listen to the industry, but, there were, uh, but this really taught me that that's the way to go. Listen to the industry, do what they, if it's possible and, and practical for a company our size, considering, you know, we are the little guys here. 
you know, Anjanu, Zeiss, uh, Canon, Fujinon, these are billion dollar companies and I'm it when it gets to, when it gets to cook, we're, we're the small guys. So the way I'd like to think that we stay ahead of our competition is to out innovate and get stuff to market as quickly as possible and to give people as many of the tools as we can to do their job. What can we see next? Hopefully all can be at NAB next year or Cinegear next year. We are working on, you know, you know, my, as I said, my philosophy is to keep moving and to be a moving target for our competitors while still producing things that the industry needs, not just producing things to produce them. Yeah. And I think we are, we will have uh, next year, we'll, as almost every year, we'll have new lenses to see next year. And that's uh, very exciting. Whether we see them at NRV or not, who knows? You know, it's, uh, you know the, the, the big shows, uh, you know, it's kind of not hard to know what the, what the future holds when we come out the other side of this. Yeah, usually cinematographers would come to the booth and try the lenses and see the lenses and or maybe stop by the shop and see the lenses. But how in this time of social distancing are you getting these new lenses, the new Series 7s and the 85 anamorphic um, on cinematographers' uh, radar? We will probably be doing some videos with the new lenses and showing, you know, we're, we're completely rethinking how we get out there. Uh, my guy that covers Taiwan, he lives in the States, but he covers the far, far east. He called me the other day and he said, you know, Taiwan is open for business. I think I'll try and go there because we do a good amount of business there. And I said, great. And then he called me back and he said, one, getting flights there right now is just about impossible. But he did figure that out. But then he said, two, when he gets off the plane there, they're going to make him stay in a hotel for four weeks before he can go in the country. So... Obviously, that's going to be a non-starter. Uh, you know, the way we, I think the way we, the way we interact with most of our customers is by hitting the road and going to see them. I do think we will get back to that later this year, and you know, hopefully not in the too distant future. But uh, yeah, we're looking at doing doing presentations like this. We are looking at uh, doing virtual presentations on our own. We've done a few already. And working with the local rental houses, you know, quite a few local rental houses are doing the same sort of idea to their customer base. So I think everybody is scrambling for new ideas um, to do this, um, to, to get the products out there. I mean, we are in a, a really good position being cooked because we have such a great name. And I'm sure people are looking for our new products, which makes it easier than starting from scratch. Uh, but still, we got to get them out there. We've got to get them in people's hands. One of the things I know we're doing in, is we've got the new Panasonic camera um, in London. The Panasonic's given it to us, and they put a 1.8 squeeze in it. So we're giving the lens to DPs and in uh, London to run around with this and shoot and then give us the footage so we can show people what you can do with it. So we're, we're, we're trying to be as creative as everybody else is. We all know, uh, you know this industry is a mostly a small business industry. Um, I mean, Pro Video Coalition is a small business. Cook's a small business. I'm talking to other people, and most of them are very small businesses like Bright Tangerine. Um, you've been, fortunately, have been in this business for a very long time. Yeah. Can you give any tips to anyone about how to survive these unprecedented economic you know, struggles that we have. You know, we, we, we're, we're pretty fortunate as we have been in business a long time. Uh, I've always run, during my stead here for the, the 22 years I've run Cook, it's always been very conservative. Uh, so we are in a good position to weather bad times. We've This will be the first time ever in the history of the last 22 years that we will have it. We are actually building them. We reopened, we did close our factory for about two weeks to clean it and, you know, get ready. And now uh, as of, um, we started working about 10 days ago with half staff. And then on Monday, we're going to open up to a full staff. And this will be the first time ever in 22 years, we're, we're actually going to be able to put some inventory on the shelf so that when we come out the other side of it, whenever that may be in a couple months, Hopefully, uh, 
you know, we'll be able to, to supply demand really quickly. That's uh, sage advice um, for all of us to listen to. Is there anything else that Cook would like to talk about um, that? Oh, you, oh, I mean, if this, how, how long is your take? <laughs> uh, I mean, I have, I have 130 more minutes on this card. So okay, well, let me, that, you know, in the beginning, there was a guy named William Taylor. No, me, uh, <laughs> there, there are two other things I'd like to uh, at least talk about. And uh, one is a thing called cookoptics.tv. It's our, uh, our educational resource. It is not, it is it's something we produce. I really recommend if you're not familiar with it, you go check it out. And it's cookoptics, one word, dot TV instead of dot com. It is a great resource. It is not about cook lenses. We talk to DPs, we talk to colorists, we talk to all kinds of people, behind the scenes people, and mainly DPs. And we talk about them, how they got a shot, how they lit a shot, how they interact with directors, how they interact with the actors, how they did something really, uh, how they got a shot that was really looks, you know, unbelievably complicated, like uh, filled, uh, car chases. And they sit there and say, oh, yeah, yeah, they look great, but they're not, they're not hard to shoot. And they go through and they talk about that. We have DTs deconstructing I either work they've done or work other people, the classic work that's been done. And Cook is not, it doesn't matter whether the film they're talking about was shot on Cook or Panavision or Zeiss, or you, you fill in the blank. It, it's, it's people that have interesting stories in the industry to tell. We've interviewed um, uh, Jörg Pullman when he was president, he's no longer president of ARI, but he was interviewed. So. We've talked from people to all over the industry, competitors, non-competitors. Cook has really, it's just a service we do for the industry. And some film schools, in fact, use it as a teaching tool. So I really recommend to you and your viewers that if, you have, if you're not familiar with it, please check it out. We put a new video up about, they're like five minute videos and they go up pretty much every week. Um, and, the, and I think we must have 150, 200 of them up there now because we've been doing it for a few years. So I really recommend, um, you know, let's take a look at that. We have another new site that was created about a year ago called shotoncook.com. Again, all one word. Obviously, this one is lens specific. It is about people that shoot with cooks. And it's by invitation or by people submitting their work. It's not a trailer park of things that were shot on Cook, it's not a trailer park for features, but we really are looking for some of the best looking work shot on Cook lenses. And it's searchable by genre, by uh, by lens type. So you can search, uh, for instance, you can search uh, by commercial commercials, you can search for car commercials that were shot on S7s. And so if you're planning to do a shoot, you, you, you and, and the director can get a pretty good feel of what you're going to see uh, when you get to the rental house and maybe start to look and evaluate lenses. You can sort of get a, a pre-visualization of, of what these lenses are capable of doing. So that's a pretty exciting site, site and um, I encourage people to check that out. And then lastly, 20 years ago, we started what I call the Splash Eye Project. And it's an, I stands for intelligence. It is a metadata system for lenses to talk to other equipment. And over the years, it's grown and grown and grown. It's gone from a simple lens information. A few years back, we added inertial data. It now includes uh, distortion and shading data. And all our, and, and we freely given it to the industry. I mean, I, I'd love to get some more credit for it, but the bottom line is for us, for this to work, for metadata to work, everybody has to use the same system. You can't have people speaking different languages. People will just get frustrated and not use it. So we've given it to all our competitors. Virtually all the major camera manufacturers use it and can understand it. Um, all of our competitors are licensed to use it. Whether they use it or not is up to them. But you know, our main competitor, that's the company that starts with the Z, uh, they use it. And um, so we're quite pleased with that. We continue to expand uh, what, what I can do. 
and expand uh, its ability and usefulness uh, both on the set, uh, but you know, also in a way to get information to post-production now that effects and VFX has become so much a part of virtually every production now, especially I think when we come out of, out of the other side of this, you know, people are gonna look much more for virtual sets and how to do things in isolation and with smaller crews and not necessarily going to Timbuktu to shoot, but to sit in a, sit in a, um, an LED box, you know, with their various, you know, scenery flashing behind them. Um, and so that, that, uh, you know, uh, that, that's an, another thing that Cook has done and, and invested a lot of time and energy and money in, but also as a service to the industry, we, we've sort of put it out there for other people to use. And, and for the most part, it's been adopted by everybody. Yeah, I think the adoption of the Unreal Engine in real time, world simulation and chroma keying on a client monitor is the way, if you, if you have not seen that, it's, it's uh, I think it's the way forward for green screen and, and it's filmmaking. Um, Unreal Engine, and we use it for, I shot a kids TV show and we used it for that. And my, my goodness, it takes the guesswork out of green screen, um, but you need that lens data too. It takes all that data and uh, right. applies it uh, immediately to the scene behind the subject. It's pretty impressive. I wish everybody, you know, be safe, be smart about getting out there. Uh, and when you do get out there, try to use Cook lenses. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to talk with me today. A deep dive into Cook, new, new products from Cook, from Series 7s to macros to 85 millimeter full frame anamorphic, large format anamorphic. So we can't see them in person, but you can go to cookoptics.tv and you can also go to the website, what is the name of the website for Cook? They uh, cookoptics.com is the, the corporate website and you can see all these products. And then cookoptics.tv is a separate website, um, you know, for all these educational videos. Thank you for taking the time. Well, will talk to, I hope to sure. see you at Cinegear, hopefully in October. If the mayor of uh, LA keeps to be um, on his current course, I'm not sure about City Gear in October, but I hope it's there. I look forward to seeing all our friends. Well, we can plan for the worst and hope for the best, and maybe hope is what we need right now. Thank you for taking the time. Brian, thank you.